they realized was, again, for people who are 60 years and over, only 28% were living in houses that they owned. That's the, where you see the star at the top. In red, perching, squatting, 22% of all people who were above 60 were perching somewhere or squatting. Guys, it's no joke. It is no joke. So when I say take your pen and paper and act, do something, you have to do something. And the something that you are going to do is not for me, Jillian, is not for Data Bank, is not for anybody but you. Because we will all get to 60 and your life at 60 will be entirely up to you. So we move on. How do you know which investment is right for you? Whether, and again, with investing, crisis or no crisis, the principles are the same. So I'll walk through very quickly how you know which investment is right for you so you can make the decisions you need to. Number one, you need to know that what works for somebody else does not necessarily work for you. You can't copy when it comes to investing. There's no such thing. So you may have your best, best friend or your husband or your wife who their, invest, their, their tolerance for investments and their investment knowledge is high. So they're buying stocks on the stock exchange, they're investing in equity funds. Because they're doing it doesn't mean it will work for you if you don't have the same level of tolerance or stamina. So you have to know that what works for somebody else may not work for you. Investing is a very personal decision. So you have to know why you're investing. That's the first thing. Are you investing because you want to buy real estate? You want to buy a car? You want to start a business? Why are you investing? There's always a reason. And the reason why we ask why you're investing is that the reason usually has a time frame with it. So you may be saying that you want to buy a house but you want to buy a house 10 years from now. So your time frame is long term. You may be saying, though, that you want to start a business and you want to start a business in the next year. Your time frame is short term. So you need to know, you need to be able to link why you are investing to the time frame. That's step number one. So you have to know your time horizon. That's what it's called. Then the next thing that you need to know is what we call your risk tolerance. So you can't talk, everybody is muted, but I would like you to actually answer this question in your head. So imagine that each of you had 1,000 CDs and you were bringing it to Data Bank to invest on your behalf and you've told us that you don't need the money for another five years. But at the end of the first year, you check your balance and the 1,000 CDs is now 900 CDs. How would you react? Three choices, very simple. Number one, if you look at the image to the left with the dark glasses, option one is your 1,000 CDs is now 900 CDs, but you are not concerned because you have a five-year time horizon, so you're okay, you're cool. That's option one. If that is your answer, then we say your risk tolerance is high. Option two, you are concerned, but you decide that you'll still leave the money and watch it and see how it goes. If that's your answer, your risk tolerance is medium. If you are saying to yourself, no, this 1,000 CDs, I cannot afford for it to get to 900, so give me the 900, let me take it and go somewhere else, then you are option three and you are very concerned and your risk tolerance is low. Now, there is no right or wrong answer. When, when I go through this exercise with people in, like in the physical investment seminars, 
you'll find that people often, they're, they're afraid to raise their hands and say it's low. But there's no wrong answer. There's only your answer. So whatever answer you decide, no problem. I will show you what you can invest in. So you need to match the risk tolerance. So the answer that you got, whether you're low, medium, or high, depending on your answer, there are a range of products that you can invest in. So if you are low, you will only, or you should only invest in what they call fixed income investment. So if you are with Data Bank as an example, then M Fund is a fixed income fund. Eddy Fund Tier 1 is a fixed income fund. Treasury bills are considered fixed income. Bonds are considered fixed income. Simply put, when you put your money in, the performance is very steady. There's no up and down, up and down. It's very steady. If your answer was medium, so you're concerned, but you would still leave it, and so you have a medium risk tolerance, then you can begin to add balance funds. So you begin to take investments that have a little bit of equity, but not too much. Equity is simply investments that are on the stock market, like you purchase shares in MTN or some of those things. If your risk tolerance is high, then you can do fixed income, you can do balance, and you can do equity, up to shares on the stock market. But know yourself. Know yourself. Number six, don't make investment decisions based on emotion. So we're in a crisis right now. Some people are freaking out. And what happens is when people freak out, it's usually when the market is going down and the, the, the price of shares is falling. So they freak out and they sell. Whether it's an equity mutual fund or it's shares, they sell when the price is low. And then when the price goes up and everybody is happy, then they come back and buy. But what has happened is that they have bought at a much higher price. So that the amount of money they can make on that investment is even less because you've bought high which is the difference is completely different from when in normal times you would buy something on sale. It, that's what you should do with investing, but people do the opposite. They buy when things are high and they sell when the price is low. What you need to do as an investor is you just stay steady. You steady, ride out the market cycle, and you will find that in the end, you will actually be better off. So finally, finally, um, the most important thing that you can do for yourself is you start investing early. This slide is an example, very simple example of, let's say you want to have 1 million CDs by the time you're age 60. I'm not sure there's anybody who is 20 on this call, but let's assume you're 20. If you are 20 and you're getting an average of 15%, so your money is growing at an average of 15% every year, you would only need to invest 45 CDs a month to get 1 million by the time you're 60. If you jump to age 25, the amount goes to 89 CDs a month. What you need to realize with this chart is every five years you wait, the amount you need to invest to get to your goal will double. So I've had situations where I've spoken to people in one year, you see them three years later and they'll tell you, oh, I'm just about to start. What it means is the just about to start, the amount you need is now higher than what you needed three years ago. So whatever age you are, there's a number that you need. And you need to get that number and you need to start working towards it. Match your investment with your risk tolerance and you start investing early. It is the most important thing you can do because if you are investing early, then when crisis comes, it won't shake you. And that's the message that I would like to give everyone today. Thank you very much. I'm done, George. Thank you very much, Jillian. This 
I mean, I was glued to the screen <laughs> and my pen was writing so many things in my diary. And I want to say thank you. At this point, I know that our participants are very well enlightened and educated by what you've just shared with us. And so we'll take some minutes of questions um, from okay. the participants. And so um, we're going to keep this very structured. If you have a question to ask, kindly raise your hand using the icon great. So Beatrice has risen her hand. Um, kindly raise Hello. your hand and then we'll take your question. So Beatrice, kindly ask your question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much enlightened this evening. But then my question is, um, it's an like an educational investment, the same as um, insurance, educate, like you're doing insurance for your kids. Because I'm married, I have two kids. I've done two different ed educational insurance for them. Is it the same as what Madame was talking about? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, actually, that's a really good question. And the answer is no. So generally, insurance is, insurance is different from investment. With insurance, typically, the way they structure the policies is that it is there to protect you or to provide for someone in the event that something goes wrong. That's, that's the principle of insurance. So what the insurance companies have done over the years is that they have now introduced like a cash back policy where they'll say, okay, if you um, buy insurance for a certain amount of time, then you'll get back a portion in cash. There's nothing wrong with insurance, but insurance should be used for the purpose that it has been designed, which is to protect you or a loved one against some event. The difference with investing is when you invest, whatever money you put in is your money. So you're not paying a premium, you're not doing anything, you're putting money in towards your investment goal. You can access it at any time, which again is a different, is different from insurance. So when you buy the insurance policy, you're paying a premium every month. Even if they give you back money, it will not be the same amount you gave them because they would have taken some to pay for all the different um, expenses related to it. So insurance and investment, two separate things. If you want to invest for your child's education, do it in an investment. If you want to provide for your child in case something happens to you, you can get an insurance policy as well. But if you have actually, if you've been consistent with your investing and you have enough, you don't need that much insurance either to cover events like education because you would have covered it through your investment. So it's two different things. I hope thank I've answered. Yes. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you. I have Bismarck and Robert's hands raised. And so I'll take Bismarck first. Then I'll go ahead to take Robert. Then you answer them both. As okay. Go. No Great. Problem. So Bismarck, please unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your education and all. But for the past two months, I've invested in 400 cities. And I want to know how much is the investment, like the percentage that you get every month. So is it good to check it every month? And how much is the investment, like the percentage that you get with this 400 cities? Because the last time I went to check, I didn't like the figure because <laughs> it wasn't going forward. Like it's stagnant. It's not moving. So please, can you check it for me how the percentage will be for the past two weeks, hey, two months, uh, if I've invested 400 cities? Okay. Please, that's my question. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So, um, Robert, mm -hmm. kindly ask your question. Okay. And I'm good even. Um, just on the first of all, thank you for the presentation. Well, I want to ask. You want to make a long-term investment. We know that cash, like money, is really liquid. 
and then due to over time like inflation creeps in. So between stock, mutual fund, and then commodity, which one is best advisable to invest in? Like commodity like gold and silver, then stock on the on the stock market, and then maybe liquid cash over a long period of over 10 years, which one is best to invest in looking at inflation? Okay. All right. Thank you, Robert and Bismarck. So Bismarck. Okay, please I'll... let me let me let me let me finish with my mine was oh. um mutual fund. Mine was mutual fund. So I want you to check the mutual fund. Okay. So I'll go ahead now and start answering. So Bismarck, your question was about investing 400 CDs two months ago and the money is not really growing the way you would like. So you, you want to know what percentage you would get. It depends on what kind of fund you invested in. So as I had mentioned, you have fixed income funds, you have balance funds, you have equity funds. If you had put money in a fixed income fund, let's say at Data Bank, you had put it in M fund, you would have seen steady growth, but two months is really not a long time. So you shouldn't expect to see your money doubling or anything like that. Also, the regulator, just so you know, has by law, we're not allowed to guarantee in returns. So Nobody, like no investment company should tell you, Bismarck, if you give me 400 CDs, I will give you back 500 or 600 in two months. If they're doing that, they're lying and the regulator will find them and put them out of business because we're not supposed to give guarantees. The only thing that you will get a guaranteed return on would be government securities, like, like treasury bills, bonds that you can get a guarantee on. But with that guarantee, you lose some flexibility because then you can't go in and out as quickly as you would like to. So it depends, the answer depends on what you actually invested in. If you had invested in any mutual fund that had equity in there, it is likely you would have seen little to no growth in the last two months because the stock market, Ghana stock market has been declining. It's actually been on a steady decline from April 2018 until now. Like it's just been dropping, dropping, dropping for a number of reasons. The way stock markets work is that they go down and then they go back up and then they go down again. We just happen to be in a downward, on the downward slope at this time. So. It depends on what you invested in. If it had to do with, if, if there's equity in the investment at all, then you would have seen very little to no growth. What you should do if it bothers you is don't get scared. Don't necessarily pull out your 400 CD, but any new money that you put in, put it in fixed income where it will be more steady and the fixed income market right now is stronger and doing better. So, I hope that answers your question, but if there's a specific investment that you want me to look at, you can always get my contact and reach me after. For Robert, long-term investment, which one is better, stock, mutual fund, or commodities, considering inflation? Um, with, so with mutual funds, with any investment, but particularly with mutual funds, the example that I shared for uh, a few minutes ago with if you're age 25, you would need to invest 89 CDs a month to get your 1 million. Even though we've given you a flat figure, what we tell people is keep an eye on inflation and every year you increase the amount by inflation. So let's say Inflation is averaging 10%. Every year, increase the amount that you're investing each month by 10%. That way, your money will keep pace with inflation. That's one thing. With shares, if you are buying shares directly on the stock exchange, you, there's no hedge for inflation in that. The price is what it is. 
So shares are for people who have a high risk tolerance and they are willing to take whatever comes, whether it goes really high or really low. If you don't have that level of tolerance, then stay away from shares. You can do commodities, but normally to get into commodities, you need more money. So mutual funds gives you the most flexibility and it allows you to invest with the least amount possible. And it also gives you easier access to your money than other investments. But the main thing that you should keep in mind is you need, even if you do commodities, you need to have liquidity and an investment that you can access quite quickly. We have people who have assets like houses and businesses, but they're cash poor. They have no cash. So you want to always keep a little bit of money. I would say instead of keeping it on under your mattress or at home, keep it in a fixed income fund that will, it won't fluctuate, but it will still grow small, small, small until you need it. But always have a portion of your money in something that is liquid where you can get to it within a day or a few days. And then if you have extra, then you can invest in commodities. If you have the tolerance, you can go to the stock market. But right now, the way the stock market is, I don't recommend it unless you really, 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 really are willing to take that risk because you won't like your experience right now. Okay, thank you, Jillian. I have two hands raised. Um, I think that upon the answering of the second hand, I'll put finality to Jillian's session so that we can take our next speaker. And so I can see Nana Kwame Adai, Esiama, and then Willis Pip. Um, Nana Kwame, if you can hear me, can you unmute your microphone and ask your question? Uh, good evening. Um, Madam, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my question has to do with... Good evening. Um, Hello, can I, I, wait, I think Willie is, is trying to talk to you. Hello, uh, can I speak? Yes, Nana Kami, you may speak. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 my question is how do I ascertain the safety of my investment with an institution? How do you know the safety of your investment with an institution in terms yeah, of institution. in in so just to clarify in terms of whether when you need your money the institution will be there or no, um, if 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 I, 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 I take the recent happenings with uh, some of the banks where a lot of money has been locked with some of the financial institutions that's why I'm asking that question. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So thank you, Nana Kwam. Your question will be duly answered. Um, Willis, please, if you can hear me, please ask your question. Yeah. Well, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Um, I want to find out, won't it be... Uh, uh, more advisable if you have, for instance, as the gentleman did mention earlier on, that you are 400 Ghana cities um, invested and you were waiting for a return, which um, per his expectation, the return has been very insignificant. Uh, wouldn't that be more advisable if you invest invest it into a business um, considering the risk fact that you know the risks involved in that business is not so high only it be a bit better to invest into the business as compared to investing in a, uh, a bank All right, I've got it.
So I'll go ahead and answer, George, if that's okay with you. That's very okay. Okay, so Nana Kwame, your question was, how do you know basically that your money is safe, considering that a number of many clients have had their money locked up in a number of different institutions? What I would say is, one, it is very important that you as an investor do some level of research on the company before you invest. So that includes, one, uh, calling the regulator. Even if you don't call, so one, you should know who the regulator is for the industry. So for us in investments, the regulator is the Securities and Exchange Commission. You can actually go to their website, and when you go to their website, they will list all the fund managers that are in Ghana, and then they will let you know the standing of all of the fund managers in Ghana. So you will be able to see those that are in compliance with them, and you will also be able to see those that have issues because they've color-coded it, and they've highlighted it red, and those that are red, they will say either have pending regulatory issues or customer complaints, if I can remember. So step one is always check with your regulator. Check their website or give them a call and just say, I would like to invest with this company. Do you, are there any complaints or are there any issues that I should be aware of? They will tell you. They won't tell you go and invest, but they will tell you that you don't have any issues with this company and this company is compliant. That's step one. After that, you should then look at the company itself. Look at the level of transparency from the company. So if you go, for example, to the company's website, can you see the performance of their funds? Like how transparent is the company in terms of reporting, on themselves, the performance of their products, all of those things. There are some websites you go to, you won't find any information. You will call them, you won't get any information. So do some research on the company itself. You can also ask around, ask friends, family, who have also invested with the company, whether they have had issues getting their money from that company as well. Because now, maybe four or five years ago, that wasn't even a question that you would ask. Today, that's now a really important question. So you want to ask and find out how are people finding their experience with the company? Generally, if there's an issue, you will find a few people who will tell you there's an issue, be careful. So a lot of, Nana Kwame, a lot of what will happen is you yourself will need to do some research and ask questions. And if there's anything that you hear that doesn't sit well, double check. Don't take it blindly. So, because there are people, you will always find somebody who has a grudge or something and they will say something bad, which is not necessarily the truth. But if you ask around and you do your research, you will get the answer. And a lot of the companies that had problems, if you ask the people that have been burned, they heard and they heard rumors and they, there were signs, there were actual signs, both from the regulator and from people if you had spoken to them, even the company itself. So I would say your answer lies in research. There's no perfect company. There's no perfect company at all, but there are very good companies out there, even in spite of all of those that have been shut down. So do your research and then um, you move with your money. Um, I'll answer Willie's question, and he was asking, wouldn't it be advisable since the return was low for the guy who had invested 400 CDs and not seen what he wanted in two months, they rather invested in a business, considering risk in business is not high. Willis, it all depends on the business that you're investing in, because some businesses will consume all the money you have and more. So the, the, the beauty of investing, so I'm not saying take every cent or every peso that you have and put it in investment. If you have a business idea or you have a business that you want to invest in, 
put money there, but also put money into an investment that is not dependent on the growth of it is not dependent on whether customers come to buy from you or not. Imagine that you had that mindset and in February, you took your 400 CDs and went to invest in a business selling, I don't know, clothes, shoes, whatever. COVID came, you had to shut down. You have no money. You have no clients. You have no money. There's nobody to buy. The money that's sitting in an investment still keeps growing. Whether the office is shut or not, the way investments work, it's still going in the background. So there, don't treat it as an absolute. If you have a business you want to invest in, by all means do it. But don't invest all your money in a, in a, in a business, sorry. Spread it out a bit, have some in investments, have some in your business, and then enjoy the benefits of both. But just know that if business was a guaranteed success, we'd all be millionaires. Most people who are in business, they don't last that long. So don't put all your eggs in one business basket. That would be my advice. And for, as I had mentioned to Bismarck, two months is a really, really short. Jillian, if you can hear me, I'm I can't hear you. Can anybody hear Jillian? No, I, I can't hear. Oh, it says, no, please. We can't hear. Can't hear anything. No, we can't hear. No, we can't hear. No, we can't hear you. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Really? Okay, we can hear you now. Better now. <laughs> okay. So, did you hear the answer I gave to Nana Kwame? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, please. And did you hear the answer I gave to Willis about business? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, I stopped talking after that, so that's why you didn't hear anything else. Because okay. I had finished answering. Okay. So that's that's it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Thank please, you. Please, 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 can I come in here? Please. please, can I come in here, please? Is that this much? Yeah, please. Uh, um, okay. Uh, please, just just a second. Some three seconds. I'm, I'm done with what I'm saying. Oh, uh, please, I want to ask, like, if I can give you the figure now, eh? it's, it's even marvelous, you like, nothing, it, 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 it seems like nothing, not even tempestuous, like, nothing at all. Okay, so, let me talk about it. <laughs> That's where I said, it depends on what kind of investment it was. So, um, Bismarck, since they need to move on to the next section, I will give you my email address, okay? And then you can send me an email and we can continue the conversation. Okay, okay. That's okay? Okay, that's okay. All right, very good. I'll thank send you, you a message. Good. Thank you. All right, so thank you so much, Julian. Um, we will move to the next session, but I would want to, once again, say a big thank you to Julian. Our next speaker is Mr. David Yanesha Tete. He used to work with car brokers as CEO for well over a decade. He's an investment consultant with industry experience in securities trading, investment banking and corporate finance, market research, and wealth management. Beyond the industry experience he's had over the period, he also has some good teaching experience with the Ghana Stock Exchange, Bank of Ghana, PwC, and as a guest lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. 
you'll be speaking to us on how to make money and invest in times of scarcity. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's receive Mr. David Ganesha Tete. Hi, good evening to you all. Good evening, David. Good evening. Uh, uh, thank you, George, for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here and share some knowledge with all of you this evening. Tweak my presentation to leave out the parts where she's mentioned and try and show you some statistics to help guide you as to how you can do your investments uh, in these times and beyond. So uh, I hope I'm allowed to share my screen, George. Okay. So um, we, we all know what is happening right now with the coronavirus. Um, globally, we've had about 5 million cases with about 6% deaths and 39% people recovered. Um, locally in Ghana, we've had about 6,000 cases. Um, we have a very low death rate. Our recovery is uh, 29%. Um, everywhere you go, they say you should wash your hands. Don't shake people. We are not traveling anymore. We should stay at home. We must put masks on our face. And travel when the NEC is organizing a seminar. Now we are doing it online. Um, a, few, a few months ago, this would have been a physical event where we would have gathered in a hall. You have the speakers talking to us. And this is quite efficient and everybody is still able to get the same message. So we have a new normal now that we are all trying to invite as we go on. Um, impact of this virus, I think there are times all over the world we are expecting a slowdown. Um, Ghana not being an exception. So you see the graph on the right shows us uh, in the middle. We see what our initial forecast was for Ghana. And then you see what it has been revised to, to two and a half percent. So obviously we are all affected because we are not going to see the growth we expected for 2020. Although we are all hoping that this should pass quickly and then we all come back to normal. Um, for those of you who like statistics and understand graphs, the impact on financial assets, starting from inflation, we see inflation which was trending downwards last year, has started to spike down to about 10%, and is threatening to go above what the Bank of Ghana target is. But we, you know, when you look out uh, on the outlook, we think that it will trend downwards. Uh, if you look at the securities market, we see a lot of securities outstanding when it comes to fixed income, and we see a slight shift in the yield curve. So this means that interest rates are changing gradually on the secondary markets for bonds. The stock exchange itself, which shows a brief history about returns on the stock exchange that includes the one for the first this year. So Gillian had mentioned that the stock exchange had been in a bit of a decline. So this screen shows that from 2018, um, the stock exchange was negative six, 2019, about negative 12%. And in first quarter 2020, the COVID is still pushing the market down, and we've experienced a drop of negative 4.3%. Uh, impact on real sector investments. You can see this graph shows that it depends on which sector you're working in, really, and uh, what your line of work is. Some sectors have taken a bigger hit than others. So if you look at aviation, if you look at hospitality and upstream oil and gas, the hit has been more severe. If you go around to our hotels now, they are empty. If people are not coming into Ghana, uh, their flights are not coming in, 
there are no people to stay in the hotels. So most of the hotels are empty. Some of them have even shut down. Of course, the airlines are not coming. They are not flying at all. Recently, in Ghana, we tried to let the domestic flights take off, but not much of it, not much uh, volumes are happening in there. In terms of uh, moderate hits, comets, real estate, and general services have taken moderate hits. Of course, if you are an events manager, in the last uh, six to seven weeks, there's nothing you could have done. On the other hand, some, some sectors are seeing gains. Uh, E-commerce, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, orders going online now with delivery services attached to them. So they are gaining from this pandemic. Digital education is doing well. The telcos, well, now we're all home and using a lot of data. Um, MTN, uh, Vodafone, Airtel, Tigo are uh, uh, benefiting from this. And then fintechs, now a lot of payments uh, is going through um, online channels. All the banks are encouraging their customers to use the digital channels and to stay away from physically coming into the banks. Now, choice of financial assets at this time. Uh, Gillian had mentioned a lot of things when it comes to financial assets. So what I would say is that um, COVID or no COVID, everybody must have a portfolio. And in your portfolio, you have assets which range from cash, fixed income, investments, collective.